welcome. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me and having me here today. Um, when I received this topic, developing a game plan, um, at first I started thinking about what I want to talk about. Because it, over the last couple of years, it became so natural to me that I never really think about how do I develop a game plan. I just do it. And um, so I called my assistant coach and I said, what, what are we doing? How, how do we really approach this? And, and he started laughing. And he said, yeah, you don't know it because it's my work all the time. Um, <laughs> and I said, yeah, maybe you're right. Uh, but uh, I, came up, I came up with some ideas and that's what I want to share today with you. Um, first, when we're developing a game plan, I think there are three stages. I mean, the first stage for me is scouting. And honestly, that's not my job over the last couple of years. Um, I only take the scouting. The second part is analysis to see what, what the scouting is telling us or what we can take out of the scouting. And the last part is we're making a, a plan for the game. The first thing I want to talk about is scouting for coaches. I think when we talk about scouting, there is two different types of scouting. First, there is scouting for coaches and there is scouting for players. I had the opportunity to see an NBA scouting report from the New York Knicks, I think like 10 years ago, that is distributed from the responsible coach. I mean, I, I don't know if you know how they work. They have like six assistant coaches and every coach has one game and then they go, the next coach has the next game and that's, this is how they worked it. So one coach is preparing the scouting report and sharing it with other coaches. It's a booklet, it's about 200 pages thick. And the guys that I've coached over the last 10 years or so, I want to say if I give anyone this booklet, I can guarantee nobody goes past page 10, if at all. And so I always thought that we, you need to do two scoutings. You need one scouting for the coaches and one scouting for the players. First for the coaches. I mean, one thing that's, that we always did is that we directly after the, after the end of the game, we start thinking about the next game. Doesn't matter the result or doesn't matter where we are or how long we have for the next game. Immediately after the game, we're thinking about the next game. Even in the, I mean, we have the rule that even in the locker room, when we finish the game, we start preparing the next game. The responsible assistant coach is handing out the scouting reports to us. We're always making a detailed analysis of the last three games of the opponent. And if we are talking about second, third round or whatever, uh, eventual first meeting with the opponent. What I want or what I feel is necessary is I want a statistical report. I will come to that later, what I want exactly. Some scouting about what kind of offenses they play, what kind of defenses, and of course about the players and also about the coaches. I think this is something that, that we often oversee when we talk about scouting reports. It's not only necessary to scout the players, oops, but also to scout the coaches. Like, for example, what kind of out of time out situations they are playing? What kind of habits do they have? I mean, coaches are humans and they develop habits. And, and I do have a habit, for example, that after every time out, we have a combo offense that, a combo offense that we are playing they can be used against man-to-man -man and zone defense. Because I, wanna, I don't want to go into that trap that the other coach maybe I'm drawing up something man-to-man -man offense and all of a sudden I'm facing a zone. Or I'm drawing up something against zone because they played zone the last couple of possessions, now they change for one, for one time. Um, so we're also scouting the opponent coaches. What kind of habits do they have? Do they, do they try to trick me? Do they play these kind of coaching games? You know, Time out, somebody's taking a timeout, I'm changing the defense, or somebody's taking a timeout, I'm changing alignments, or whatever. And last but not least, tendencies. What, what kind of tendencies does the, does the other team have? Like, are they more a team that, that works in spurts? Or is it a consistent team? Is it a team that goes up and down? Um, I are, we have one more point, sorry. Then we also put something in the scouting report for coaches, like who are going to be the referees? Um, where are we playing? Are we playing home or away? Um, what is going to be the circumstances there? Is it a hostile environment? Um, are the, you know, I coached the last couple of years in, in, in I want to say, 
Alkan regions of the world, and there are, there are situations where the fans really interrupt the game by throwing stuff onto the court, for example, after a tip-off, toilet paper, or um, beer. I mean, in my last stint in, in, in Hungary, there was, a, there was a rule that when I, when I would go nuts on the referees, the, the ultras would start to throw beer on the court, so I had an extra timeout. That was just the habit there, you know? I mean, everybody knew it, but you could use it at home. Um, these kind of things are, are also important, you know, when you, when you, when you come to a certain, certain level of competitiveness. Okay, about offense. When, we, when I ask scouting reports from my assistant coach to offense, we want, we want to have detailed statistical report on plays. Each play they play, how many times did they play it for every game, for every, every of the last three games, how many points they scored off of it, also, if we, if, we're, if we had the time and we're not in, in international competition also, we're also trying to, to ask what kind of points they score. Two pointers, three pointers from fouls, from low posts, from penetration. Um, also, how many fouls are drawn. I think this is something that we completely forget often. We look at, okay, how many points do they score out of the play, but not how many fouls are drawn, especially when it comes to transition. And situations used. In what situations they are using these plays? Do they use them mainly in the first half or also in the second half? Do they, do they use them only with special lineups? Do they use them after timeouts? What kind of situations? The same thing more or less for defense. This is a lot easier because usually you don't have that much defenses. Um, what defense type they are playing. Also, we're breaking down pick and roll defenses. Do they have multiple pick and roll defenses or not? Also, how often do they play it? Turnover force, this is one very important point for me because I feel that there is two categories in basketball, statistical categories that you really need to care about. One is possessions and the other one is fast break points. I will come to that later. So this is very, very important to me how many, how many turnovers they force and what situation to use. Ah, oh, before I go here, wait. I want to say something about offense. Okay, when we talk about offense, I didn't put this here, I forget this. We, we sort this, the, we sort the plays by actions. What I, what I want to do, okay, I want to know what kind of plays they are playing, but what really is interesting for me is not what type of plays they are playing, but what kind of actions they are using. You play a play for a certain reason. For example, the action could be side pick and roll, or could be slot pick and roll, or could be low post for five, or low post for a guard. This is what really interests me, because in the end, and I will come to this later, I don't want to defend the play, I want to defend the action. Okay, we gather all this information, and I don't want to go too, too much in detail about this, but, but Basically, we are focusing on four to five offensive actions that we are really analyzing deeply then with video um, where, where we watch these clips. I mean, I had the, I, had, I don't know how many, how many of you guys have the opportunity to use Synergy? This is the same? It's already pre? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, I had the opportunity to use Synergy, which makes it a lot easier. You just go in there and you type, okay, I want to see all side pick and rolls, and it shows you all the side pick and rolls of this team from all the games played this year. So it's, it's rather easy to access a video. Um, a lot easier than at my time when I was assistant coach. We, I, had, I had the pleasure to have a head coach who liked to use a DVD player, so we had to burn every clip on DVD before showing him. Um, but yeah. Okay, then we go to the scouting for the players. We, we take all this information and we create a scouting report for the players. The first rule that I have is keep it sound and simple. I have the experience that smart players can remember up to three things per topic. The, let's call them not so smart players. They leave the scouting report in the locker and they give it back to you, and you can see on the top that it's never been turned. So 
for me, it's important that I give them little information, but important information, and I request that this information that I give them, they can give back and they can use in the game. On defense. Most used plays, but again, it's more about the actions in these plays than what it is about the play itself. Most used defenses, and with a special focus, with a special focus on pick and roll defense, what, what the players shall expect, is there a lot of pressure when you come off the screen, or is it more contained? Do you, do you need to create separation, or do you try to turn the corner? This kind of information here about the defense. And then individual scouting, and same again. I've had scouting reports. There is information about the player, which color socks he's wearing and, and, and what time of the day he's taking a nap. Yeah, it, there are players, there are some players, very few players who can use this information. There is one guy, I don't know if you ever read this article about Shane Battier, who won the, the championship with the Heat. He knew from his opponents the exact scoring percentages on all parts of the court. He used, like, he, when he was guarding Kobe Bryant, he knew he would catch, catch the ball on 45, two dribbles to the left, 28%. Two dribbles to the right, 34%. One dribble to the right, 40%. He would, he would know that, and depending on that information, he would guard the players. I have doubts that there are more than 25 players in the world who, can, who have that kind of, of ability. I know that players, when they are experienced and when they are engaged, they can use information such as, okay, he's very good when he's using two dribbles, he's not so good when he's using one dribble, he has problems with stopping when, he, when he's going with one dribbling, this kind of information. But more than that, I, I find it very difficult, especially, especially when fatigue sets in. And one more thing that we always put in there is offensive goals. In, in, in our place, what, what we want to do or what we want to use in the game um, to, to give them some, I mean, obviously, obviously we never saw, say we want to win. I mean, that's, I think it's basic. Um, but we set, some, we set some goals what we want to achieve, to dictate the pace, for example. Uh, I brought, just to give you some short impression what we are handing out to the players I mix it up a little bit because I don't want to share too much information about teams something about our opponent just in short what we have just a short summary one or two sentences then key players the players that we want to focus on then offense and defense basic description not too deep um, for example this team fast break and transition team with early picks that was, their, that was, I remember that, was their first option. Run down the sideline and whoever big man is coming that side screen and go from there, more or less scramble. Um, then defensively, how they are playing with, with position five, they are playing contained defense and next defense. That's also information that we're giving the players, okay, where is the help coming from on pick and rolls? Um, and then with four, they are switching. Then our, our keys, what we want to do, okay? What we want to achieve, how we want to play, and defensively, same thing. And then just basic information for their matchups, who is going to, who is going to guard who, who will start some information. Then we usually put one statistical page in there. Honestly, I thought about that, why we're doing this, and I think we're just simply doing it because we used to do it always like this. I don't think that this really has an impact. Uh, I know when I was playing, I don't know if I got a player differently when he averages 24 or when he averages 8 points. I think that's the same. I mean, one thing that is, for me, a little bit interesting is this, this uh, area, okay, who is a good 3-point shooter, who is not, and then who is a bad free throw shooter. This is especially important at the end of the game. But, again, I don't remember one situation where in the last in the heat of the in the heat of the last seconds any player said okay without inf without additional information from the coaches okay we're going to foul this and this guy usually they whack nobody or they do it unsportsmanlike 
Okay, then we'll come to the players page. Um, we have always the starters, which, the, which we're, we're thinking are the estimated starters. We put, very, like you see, very little information, okay? What is his role? Defensive role, aggressive leader, good offensive rebounder. That's it, not more. Usually we always put also, in this case it was Shepard, uh, we put some information who is, the, who is the leader of the team. And we're always trying in some way also to attack him, either to attack him physically, that we're trying to get him tired, or trying to get him to react, either retaliate with an elbow or something, some, somehow to get into him. Um, or another option is to keep the ball away from him. We did that too, that we were saying, okay, this guy, we don't want him to touch the ball. If it's a, if it's a very ball-dominant point guard, for example, we try to get him frustrated by not letting him touch the ball as much as he would like to. And then we're creating something, some, one page, and it's always one page. That we're talking about plays that, that uh, we think show the actions that the other team is using the most. And sometimes also, especially in early parts of the season, we're using plays that I want to use from a strategical point of view for developing our team. Like if I have the feeling that, okay, we practice in preparation most, most areas, but we have weaknesses, for example, in defense against side pick and roll, we would focus more on side pick and roll. Even though for this game, maybe there might be something high pick and roll better but we're always our focus is always in the long run our focus is not only to win the next game our focus is always to to peak towards the end of the season i've played against many many teams who peaked around in december and had nothing not necessarily dropped but they stayed at that level they stayed at that level and they didn't have the the the, the chance to improve when playoff time is coming um that's for example, that's one, for me, one of the biggest advantages to play in international cups is the development of, on one hand, team spirit. On the other hand, that you don't have too much practices. Players don't get bored by practicing too much. You have a lot of games and you have some leverage for later on when shortly before the playoffs, usually international competitions end, you have some three, four weeks where you have a lot of practice. Then you have another I want to call it second preseason before you go into the playoffs. Um, yeah, just to describe this quickly, we always we always put some some highlight if there is something that they are looking uh, looking for uh, in special. Um, let me see if I can see what team it is. Yeah, I remember this. This was also in Hungary team, and they have very good shooter for position four. They always play this pick and roll into down screen action which honestly we had big big problems with it and I will tell you why later because we this is part of the problem of my philosophy okay now when we're coming to the game plan what do I want to achieve and what do I think is necessary to develop a game plan and here be, here becomes a little bit of a philosophical question um, in my opinion and this is my philosophy and always has been you should, you should focus less on the opponent and more on yourself. I know there's is, there is two, two types of coaches in basketball. There's what I call the scouting coach and the development coach. The scouting coach will focus a lot on, on scouting the opponent team and thinking about strategies, tactics, um, to destroy what the other team wants to do. The development coach on the other side has his philosophy is thinking mainly about his philosophy and his way he wants to play and with game planning and with, with scouting he's working to improve his philosophy or to improve areas of his philosophy that are not I want to say 100% finalized. Why do I think development coaching is better? I have the experience and I've lost, and this is why I said, this is part of the problem of my philosophy, I've lost a lot of games to teams where my president is coming and saying, how in the world can you lose against that team? I mean, we lose a lot of games. If you watch my records, we lose against teams like they're second to last or something like this. We never lose against top teams, but we always lose against these middle to bottom level teams in the, in the regular season. 
I think development coaches can, it can happen if you are this way, that you get surprised. That they're coming up with some idea or some strategy that you didn't think of. And, and because they are focusing on your game, they might adapt their philosophy or their strategy for the game completely. Like they would probably play man-to-man -man defense for the last eight games, and all of a sudden they would come out and play a matchup zone or one three one zone and, and catch you completely off guard. Which can be an advantage if you want to win a couple of games. If you want to win a championship, that's not going to work. Because in a five, five or seven game series, I'm going to figure you out. Second part is, if I'm, a, if I'm a scouting coach, I have, in the best of all worlds, seven days to prepare for something that the other team has one whole year to prepare for. I mean, you're working with, you have your philosophy, and you're trying to do the same philosophy against every team. You're more or less working on the same stuff the whole year. And eventually, you go, if, you, if you know what you're doing, you're getting better at it than the other team who has one week to learn how you're playing this and how you're playing that and to adapt to it. And so I've, I've experienced that depending on what, what your goals are, if you want to win something or you want to be successful long term, scouting and adapting completely to the other team is a mistake. With that being said, our game planning is more about what we want to do and not so much about what we want to take away from the other team. Um, I had this, you know, when I started working with my current uh, assistant coach, um, he said, well, why are we not going through more plays of the opponent in the, in the practices? Why, why are we only practicing these actions? And, and we're, only, we're only practicing actions from other teams in four and four and three and three situations. We never, we never practice five on five opponent plays, never, never. I don't want to waste the time of my players to learn something that they can forget after three days. I don't want to, for me, this is a waste of time. I, wanna, I, want, I want them to learn how to defend this action. For example, if the other team has a very dominant low post player, I want them to know how we want to defend low post situations. But I don't care how they, how they get there. I mean, in the end, they want to put the ball in the basket and not running some sort of coordinated motion. It's not theater, it's basketball. So we have, we have principles. And that's why I said statistical category. I don't know how many of you know this, but there is one statistic in your league over the last five years. The first team, if, if, at, if at all, who reaches 20 points in transition has always won the game regardless of any other statistic. Doesn't matter. They can have 10 turnovers more, they can shoot 20% less from the field, doesn't matter. If they reach 20 points first in transition, they win the game. Now, it, if you think about it, it's a little bit logical. I mean, if you want to score in transition, you've got to rebound the ball. Without rebounding the ball, it's very unlikely that you score in transition, unless you have 10 breakaway steals. Second of all, the transition baskets are the highest percentage scoring opportunities you have in basketball because usually they're, they're numbers advantages or space advantages or timing advantages. But at least you have a big advantage. Otherwise, it's a bad choice to take the shot in transition. The second point is dictate the tempo. That is an area where we would adjust a little bit to the other team. This is something where, and I wrote dictate because I, I, I used to have their control of the tempo, but it can be misunderstood, misunderstood because controlling the tempo always means I'm, I'm, I'm slowing down. I don't want to slow down necessarily. I want to dictate the tempo. I want to have the game at a certain pace. Usually, and I'm saying usually, I want my pace to be a 95 possession game. I want the game, I want an up-tempo game. Reason, reason for that is that I usually use 10, 10, 10 and a half players. So I'm rotating a lot. I want them to be engaged in the game. This is why I want more possessions. If I'm playing 65 possessions, 
with a 10-man rotation, this means you have six and a half possessions per player, which is not a lot. You know, there's only one ball, five offensive players, so you got to, you got to shoot the ball on average one and a half times. I mean, not a lot of guys are going to be happy with that. Um, so, so we want to dictate the tempo. I mean, there are times, you know, when I know I'm playing a team that, that has a much, much deeper roster than we have, and they are very good in transition defense, and they are very good in transition offense, and, and they want to play in this fast-paced style, then I'd, I would say, okay, guys, let's, let's control the tempo in our way that we're not going to 100 or 105 possession. We want to stay at 90. Um, but usually, most of the teams that we're playing, we're trying to push the tempo. We're trying to up the tempo. We try to make them play in our, in our pace. Another advantage of this is, by the way, um, if you have teams that are not used to this pace, usually they make more mistakes. The faster the tempo, the more mistakes they make. The second is we want to play towards our strength. And with our strengths, I don't necessarily mean to our advantages, but I mean to our strengths. If, if, our, if our strength as a team is, for example, middle pick and roll, then we want to stay with this middle pick and roll regardless of the opponent. The team might be very good at defending middle pick and rolls, but that doesn't mean I'm saying, okay, now today we're playing side pick and rolls because they're good at defending that. No. I want that we build this confidence as a group that we are better at playing towards our strength than the other team possibly can be defending it. And, of course, defensively, vice versa. The first point is we, we, we always talk about creating possessions, how we can create possessions. Um, is this a team that is physically weak? We would send probably a fourth guy for the offensive rebound instead of usually three. Um, is this, a, is this a team that is very turnover prone? We would probably, I mean, we're playing always full court defense, um, but we would probably go and fake a trap every now and then. We would say, okay, every time the guy turns, we, we fake trap on turn, or maybe we'll, we'll even jump and running, you know, jump and the next guy's running, something like this. We would probably do something to, to create extra possessions for us. We feel that we always want, at the end of the day, we always want to have more possessions than the other team. And one of the, the lesser points is use advantages. Of course, we're also going then and see, okay, what kind of personal advantages we have, for example. Do we have a guy who's super fast and he's probably going to be guarded by a slower guy? Or do we have a, do we have a good inside player and they don't have anybody to match that? Um, but I, I don't want to insist on this. Um, this is something I learned over my career. I, I, at the beginning of my career, I always had this in mind that you need to attack the weaknesses of the, of the opponent. And we all know this situation. There is an important play. He has four fouls and there is like five minutes to go. The other coach decides to keep him on the court. And then we start to go against him. Instead of playing with our rhythm, we break our rhythm and we, play, we break our plan and we go to attack this guy for him to make the fifth foul. First of all, the refs know this is an important player. They're not going to give him his fifth foul. He needs to be really stupid to get his fifth foul. Second of all, second of all, the other team knows that he's in foul trouble. They are trying all kinds of different strategies to kind of protect him. Might be switching, might be doubling, might be whatever, might be going to a zone defense or whatever. Things that you are not prepared for. All of a sudden, you're coming to a situation where you're going out of your comfort zone and into the comfort zone of somebody else. And that's something that I really don't like. I always say, stay, stay with our plan. Okay, we have some advantages. And if they are within our style of play, then we use them. If they're not, then forget about them. And the last thing is scouting and, and preparation. Preparation. How we're, how we're transferring our knowledge to the players in a, in a playing situation. I said this before defensively. We're, we're focusing only on actions. Only on actions. We're focusing sometimes on individual things, like if they have a super quick point guard, we would probably simulate this in, in, in drills that we would force our slower guys 
for example, in pick and roll situations to come with a disadvantage. For example, we would, we would give them, they need to bump a coach before they are, are allowed to go out on, to guard the pick and roll, to put them in some disadvantage situations before. Um, the other thing that we're doing in, in, in preparation, of course, we're showing the players clips from what we think is important. We, we try to simulate also situations that, that can come. For example, noise. I mean, this is something that we that I started doing in Hungary. I should have done that earlier, but that became really apparent because, I mean, knowing Hungary, there are really small gyms, like small, small gyms, like this place, and they would put like 3,500 people in there. Yeah, and you couldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to hear your own, own voice, and then it becomes also something that, that creates tension. You want to get some message across to your players, and they don't understand nothing, and then you start to get pissed, like you're thinking they're not listening or whatever. And, and we're, we, we did something like that, that we started to, to put noise in the, in the practices. Like on speakers, we would put crowd noises in the practices just to simulate these kind of situations. Okay, offensive game plan. Um, I, I, I spoke a lot about this already. Now, we, we choose the point of attack where what we want to use the whole, what we want to use the whole, whole year, but depending on their defenses. For example, I'm a big fan, to be honest, I'm a big fan of, of pick and roll offense, but I don't play pick and roll offense for the guard. I play pick and roll offense for, to, in order to create a numbers advantage. I want to come to a situation where there is three on two or two on one. So my biggest goal always is to create separation between the ball handler and the screener. That two people for a short moment are guarding the ball handler, the, the say screener's defender and the guy recovering. And in this moment, I have a numbers advantage. And the best numbers advantage always is two on one. It's better than three on two. Um, but we always try to create this situation. Now, we're, we're checking how they are playing pick and roll defense. For example, they are playing contain. Let's say they are playing contain defense. What plays in our playbook are best suited, for example, slot pick and roll to the middle. This is one pick and roll that is very good against contain defense because you have one guy isolated to guard two players. And, and then we would go and, and practice this play. And then, okay, I'm, I have this here in the, in the select the place. Um, and then we, we would, we, I have in my playbook always minimum two plays for one action. Minimum. Normally three, four. Um, so we would, we would choose one play that we're using in the first half, and then we would choose another play we're using in the second half. Because usually, good coaches make adaptations at halftime. They would, they usually they have the assistant coach making some statistic, okay, they score against us with this play five down ten times, we need to do something against this. So they're going in the locker room and they're drawing up this five down and what are they doing? So I'm usually not using the same, same place first half, second half. So I, I use the same actions, but I use different plays. I use different setups to get to that point. Um, another, another thing that we, we do a lot is in, in point of attack is when we analyze what kind of screen defense it is, we, we choose the play how we prepare the screener. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of guys nowadays are talking about preparing the defender before using the screen, especially on ball handles, like attack away from the screen, and then come to the screen, get the guy in a certain stance that he cannot, he cannot push you away from the screen or he cannot push you in one direction. But I think it is minimum as important that you get the defender of the screener into a situation where he cannot come timingly to the screen. Like either, either by screening him, which is one option, you always have the risk then of a three-way switch that if you're screening with a small guy that they will put the small guy on the, on the screener's defender and, and they switch it, or by putting him in a help side situation where he is supposed to help and at the same time would cover to his man to defend the screen and roll. Um, you see this a lot by these uh, side-to-side pick and rolls that a lot of teams are playing now. 
They're playing pick and roll on one side. It's more, more or less just a decoy. It's not a real pick and roll. They're not even looking to score. They're just playing pick and roll to put the weak side defenders low, swing the ball and play pick and roll on the other side in order for the big guy to be a little bit late, a little bit slow or a little bit too deep to defend the pick and roll. That is something that we're focusing on a lot. First half, second half, I spoke about this already. Um, we also have, I also have something that early in my career, I, I always thought that it would be a good idea to go in the low post early in the game. I always thought, yeah, first offense to give the ball inside, you know, throw a little bit fouls or something. Um, and honestly, I have only bad experiences with that. Um, I feel that in the, in the early parts of the game, the other team is still focused, they're sharp, they're, they're physically ready. Um, it's very, and with the way, I need to say, with the way the game is being refereed nowadays, that more or less in the low post is more wrestling than it is something else, it is very, very tough to create a high percentage shot when everybody on the other team is really focused is really, and they have a good plan to defend the low post. So we went away from that completely to do it at the beginning of the game. But we, we figured that it's a very good point is usually when they are putting the, starting to put the second lineup on, like middle, of, middle towards end of the first quarter, depending on the coaching, um, when they bring the second lineup, usually, and this is also a, a financial issue, that most teams don't have two equal interior players. Because we all know every centimeter in basketball is costing a lot of money, and um, not most teams can pay that, that they have two really good interior players. So when they are bringing the second player, we, we tend to, to test him, to see, okay, um, let's see if you, can, if you can do something or not. Um, the third thing, what we're doing, we're preparing for special situations. Um, this is something that I feel is, is very, very important. Um, basketball is a game of runs. I mean, we all know this. You, and, and for me, the key to win the game is to make your own runs longer and to shorten the runs of the other team. And a lot of special situations, for example, two for one situations at the end of each quarter. Um, after timeout situations, situations at the beginning or, or, or end, of, end of the quarter, um, situations in, in out-of-bounds situations, side out-of-bounds, baseline out-of-bounds. And we're seeing so many side, side out-of-bounds situations because of the rule changes that we have now. It's, it's enormous. And actually, if you think about it, I mean, the idea, the idea from the rule makers is that the game becomes faster and more attractive. Um, what it does, though, is in the moment that you have an inbound, as an offensive team, you're at a disadvantage because you're playing four offensive players plus one passer against five defenders. Um, so we're, we're trying to, to find situations that we can possibly equalize this, this disadvantage. And I think you see this when you watch your league that a lot of teams on baseline out-of-bound situations, they're only focusing on getting the ball in. Not necessarily scoring, just hit it towards half court, just be lucky that we get in because coaches understand that you have five defenders, you have a bad passing angle, you have the basket in the way that you can pass more or less only on a 45 degree angle or a bounce pass, which is a terrible idea to make a bounce pass along the baseline. So this is situation, we're trying to prepare for this and we're trying to, to read and, and scout what is the other team doing. Are they really focusing on that? Are they trying to steal the ball? Are they trying to push the ball only in one corner or, or out to half court, what are they doing? And last but not least, we're always scripting. Script means for me, we're setting up usually three plays that we want to play at the beginning of the game, regardless of what's happening. Okay, unless there is a one on zero breakaway. If you really have one on zero layup, take it. But other than that, we want, we want to script the beginning of the game. This has something to do also with the, way I, with the way and the freedom that I give to the players during the rest of the game. Um, I allow them a lot of decisions by themselves. So they have sometimes the tendency that the game becomes really, really wild when they do this from the, from the get-go. So we, we say, okay, the first, first three plays, we want this, this, this. And usually what we're doing is we're doing long offenses, 20-second offenses with a lot of motion and a lot of balls changing side to side. We want the defense to move. We want to, 
to see how they are reacting to different situations. Also for us as coaches, as information, that we are seeing, okay, they are, today they are going this way or they, they are defending this way, but also for the other team not to get early a good feeling about themselves. And we all know that all teams get a good feeling about themselves by scoring the ball. Very little teams can get a good feeling about themselves by playing defense. Okay, defense. We, I spoke about this already a lot. Select actions. I do think that I do think that basketball in the end can be broken down into three areas: one on one, two on two, three on three. For me, though, this is basketball. On defense, you get the advantage that you can use two extra people in the best case. So when we're thinking about actions, we always see the court and we say, okay, if, if there's a one-on-one -on -one situation, you have, you have four people on the weak side that you can use extra. If it's a two-on-two -two situation, should it be side pick and roll, dribble handoffs, uh, whatever it might be, you have three extra people. If it's a three-on-three -three situation, you know, with a pick and ball screen and, and off ball screen afterwards, for example, or triangle situation or post split situation, you have two extra defenders. But in the end, this, I mean, there are some teams, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I got caught in this in one game before. Because we always do this and somehow, I mean, I know how, but I don't want to share this now. Um, this information got to the other coach and they actually put four players in one corner. And they played, for the first time, they played absolute nonsense pick and roll. There was no space for the guy to roll. There was no, it was absolute nonsense, only because they knew how our defensive system worked and that we always had this one guy who then was isolated on the weak side was going to open, they pass the ball and shoot three-point shot. And it took me, okay, I was maybe a little bit stubborn, but it took me till halftime until I went and said, listen, okay, they're playing this kind of bullshit defense. Let's just completely ignore the roller. Let's ignore the roller. Let's go away from our defense. Let's ignore, let's see where he goes. Where he goes, where he, there's no space where he's going. Let's see where he goes and we won the game by 20 points. But but in general, I think that if you break down basketball, there is only three and three actions. And if you know how to defend these three and three actions, you can cover everything in basketball. You can cover every play. There is not one play. There is not one play that you can that you cannot defend. So we teach our team how we want to handle this situation. And there are some situations that are more frequent, and there are some situations that are not so frequent. And we always before the game, we always repeat how we handle these situations. Um, for example, post-split situations. I saw that in the last couple of years, okay, now this year, this year is coming back in the EuroLeague, but the years before, there was very, very little post-play. Almost no post-play in terms of traditional post-play where you feed the ball from 45 into the low post. There is a lot of low post-play after pick and roll, sealing the guy under the basket and trying to enter the ball. But traditional low post-play, there is very, very little. So, also the teams that we faced, there was very little low post play, so it was kind of difficult for us to, to react to it when we saw it. Because we, okay, we were used to it in practice situations, but not in game situations. So this is something that we always repeated before every game. Because I knew we didn't see it in the game, we always repeated it in the, in the practices. Um, also things like, most teams nowadays, they have, they have spacing rules, like read and, read and react rules. Like, okay, this guy is penetrating, then weak side, I don't know, baseline drive, baseline drift is one of the, I think more or less everybody does it. I mean, there are still some teams that have different opinions, but most of the teams do it. But we also go through these kind of actions. Okay, what happens? How they're, how they're moving? How is their spacing rules? I mean, one, one thing, for example, that, that I like to do is, um, I integrate this when I first faced next defense. When, when the first time not, not, another team played next defense to me, I, I integrate this that I said, okay, instead of flare screening, which we always did on the, on the, on the weak side, we're cutting. 
we're cutting and we're replacing. And at first, it, it is a little bit difficult, and, and especially the read for the ball handler is kind of hard to make. Um, you need a lot of practice for this. But that's something that, that when you get the habit to it and when you have the players who can read this and you teach them long enough, then it's really, really effective. It's really, really effective. It's also very effective. I spoke uh, with Louis before the clinic. He said that in Belgium, everybody's playing pack line defense. It's also very, very effective against pack line defense. Um, because more or less, you're creating a wide open three-point shot for a guy that is in front of the ball handler. The ball handler's coming and all you need to do is pass the ball in front of him. Um, okay, the, the next thing is that we're doing. Prepare rhythm changer. What what we like to do, for example, is first two minutes of the game, switch everything. Just two minutes. We tell the players, okay, two minutes when the clock, there is seven, then we stop this tactic. Um, or, we're, like I said earlier, we're, we're, showing, we're showing a trap to delay. When we're, when we're showing the trap, we don't necessarily want to force turnovers. We want to delay the other team's offense. We want to put some time on the clock that when they come to the what we call danger zone, the area where they can score or can score at a high percentage, um, they have less time. Um, these kind of surprise tactics are, are things that we, we, we have in our arsenal and we use, them, we use them in every game, but not always at the same time. Could be that we're using them after a timeout, could be we're using them beginning of the second half. Always we have something that we're using to, to change the rhythm of the game. Um, to change, to change the, the dominant team of the game. I think it's very, very important that from a mental standpoint, your team is always the dominant team of the game. I think basketball is more mental than what it is anything else, and it's about dominating, acting, and reacting. And the team that's reacting, in my, in my opinion, always loses. And one funny story about this, that is a long time ago, we had an under-16 national team in Germany, and um, it was really, really bad. I mean, talent pool was really, really low. So the coach decided to play with a striker. You know, Germany, we are a soccer country, so um, he said, okay, you're the striker, which means you don't play defense, you stay at the opponent basket, and no matter what happens, as soon as we get possession, we're going to heave the ball up, and you're going to have a one and zero lap. And the funny thing is, the funny thing is, in the group stages, in the first half, every other team had big problems and was down. There was different tactics. One, one team decided to play four and four and put one guy next to him for the whole time. The other team said, okay, we we're going to play five on four and see that we can create advantage. Another team did the opposite strategy. They put also a striker. So they were going like <laughs> back and forth. Um, it's a funny story, but what I want to say, if you have a surprise, if you have something unconventional, it works. It usually won't work for the whole game. It usually won't work for a playoff series for sure. I mean, you, you need to face a really bad team if it works for a whole series. but. For a short time, it can definitely work. It can definitely work. I've had I've had another another interesting story. So we played we played we played playoffs in, in Hungary. And in Hungary, is the rule that you have to have one you have to have uh, one Hungarian player on the court. And uh, it happened that uh, I had a Hungarian player of color, and um, the referees didn't know the nationality, they just saw the skin color and said, hey, you have five imports, you got to go out. Um, so we played for a short period, for one offense, we played four and five, um, and we got to stop. And we got to stop. So it's even, it's even working at disadvantage situations sometimes, because the other team doesn't really know what to do. I mean, okay, you have one extra player, but what? Are we shooting a three-pointer? Are we, should we penetrate? What, what shall we do? So always, I always like to have something like this. And, and to coordinate this, to coordinate this, we also script them. Like we say, okay, the first, the first three opponent offenses, we want 
to switch screens, all, 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 all ball screens. Or the first three offenses, um, we want to start in man-to-man, -man, and on the first pass, we're going in zone. Or something like this. But we, we script this, and we say clearly, only three times or only two times or something like this. Always script, always script the defense. Um, just a couple of things more that, that we're not doing. I know that a couple of colleagues do that and, and they're quite successful and, and I don't want to say that, that there is only one. In basketball there is not one opinion. There is 500's opinion and all 500 opinions are right. My experience is it's not about what you want to do but how you do it how insistent you are on the things that you want to do and, and how consequently you're, you're forcing your players, in, or forcing is the wrong word, convincing your players that these things that you want to do are the right things. And um, in, in that way, I think we coaches, we're, we're more salesperson than anything else. I think our, our job is to sell our philosophy or idea to, to in my case, 12 alpha males who all think that they know everything, um, but but uh, I think that we, we need to convince, we need to sell our idea to the press, and that doesn't matter what idea it is. Um, what I have seen about game plans, um, I have seen about game, play, game plans that the other coaches determined to change the rhythm of the game in certain certain parts that they would play slow pace the first five minutes then all of a sudden to make an up and down game shoot seven seconds or less then to go back to 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 normal rhythm and this not necessarily depending on the score i mean i could understand it that you say okay i'm down 20 points last five minutes i gotta do something so the only chance i have now is to make it run and gun because if i play 24 seconds often there's no chance i'm going to catch up 20 points but but I've seen this in, in, in different situations. Um, when I spoke to the coach, then one year later, or, you know, in our community, we, we, basketball is a very, very small world, and you get to talk to the people all the time. He said, he explained to me, and he said, yeah, I want to, also my idea, to be dominant, to dictate the tempo, and if I try to dictate the same tempo the whole game, it's kind of difficult because at some point the other team will also try to dictate their tempo and it might be might arrive for my speed and it's difficult to do for the whole time but if I change it up I want to play slow and then I want to play fast I want to play slow again it's much easier for me to gain control which I can understand this point I mean I, I do think he has a point there it's not it's not my idea but I, I do think it's a good a good idea and and definitely worth a thought um, another thing that I that I saw in, in, in game planning is, is, and I actually saw it in a clinic. It was kind of funny and interesting. It was in Germany. A friend of mine held this clinic and he, he, he showed this, that he, he's making a scouting report for referees. And he has like a little cards, you know, you know all these little cards from school and with a little picture of the referee and everything and all kind of notes with, with information about the referees. And he showed it and, and he said, yeah, you know, Refereeing is such a big part of the game in our sport more than in any other sport and Because they take so many decisions. I mean, it's not like it's not like a soccer game where He's blowing the whistle. I don't know 20 times the whole game. It's like every 10 seconds or every five seconds. There's a decision made by the referee and and he said it's so important to to influence also the referees to to see, you know, how they are working in this triangle and, and, and to see which referee is where and we're trying to attack always on that side where we're thinking that we're getting more calls. I think this is, this is quite interesting. I think for me, honestly, for me, this would be too much. I mean, for me, thinking as a coach to not only see my players and opponents, but also watching who, which referee, uh, which spot, is, is, for me, it is too much. But I definitely see what he's saying. Because I, I, I've, I've coached in the FIBA Europe Cup, and especially in the FIBA Europe Cup where you have referees that are not cooperating on, on a weekly base or, or on a permanent base, and that are coming from different countries that have di different education about how to manage a game, there is 
definitely an interesting dynamic. I watched the game on Tuesday in Antwerp. I don't know how, how many guys saw the game against Yonikos. And you can definitely say that the turning point was a second flagrant or unsportsmanship foul against Antwerp's point guard. And it was absolutely clear that this was not an unsportsmanship foul, but it was a makeup call because there was another unsportsmanship foul called like 50 seconds earlier by another referee. And it, it, that's one dynamic. I'm not saying they try to attack this player or something. I'm, I doubt that in that situation. But I know that as a matter of fact, there are refs that are that are calling much, much more fouls than other referees. And it's, it can definitely be an advantage if this referee is in the right spot for you at the right time. If he is the one that is judging the situation, when you're offensively, it's definitely an advantage than when you're on defense. But as I said, for me, this is, I have too much to do with my own team than I can think about something else. Um, another thing that, that I've seen in the, in the in the game planning, and this is something very, very interesting, is substitution patterns. Um, honestly, I've never had a substitution pattern written down before the game. I've never done that. I know a lot of coaches do that, and it makes a lot of sense for a lot of coaches. For me personally, it just doesn't make sense. I, I feel it. I, I have to have this feeling when to put which player in the game and how in, in, in what kind of lineups. I do have statistics for my assistant coaches, which lineups work well together in, in, in probably you know these plus minus efficiency statistics, what, what players are good with, with what group. But I never, I've never done this. However, I think it is, a, is if you can do it and you, you, you find a way to use that effectively, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Because we're all humans, we, we, tend to, we tend to have, a, during, during a heated moment in the game, a wrong impression. We tend to forget players. I mean, I, I think it happened to every coach that there was some guy, you're mad at him, he's at the end of the bench, sometimes sitting behind the physiotherapist or, I don't know, team manager, and you just forget about him. I mean, you think about him, then you look, and he's not there, and now forget about him. And, and it helps. I mean, if you have a scripted pattern, you say, okay, in the uh, third minute, I'm substituting this group, and in the in next group, I'm, I'm substituting this group. It, it helps. It helps. Also, it also can lead to a situation where you can have different strategies for different groups. I mean, if you have a person, let's say you have a personnel group with one, with one slow big guy, and you have a personnel group with one fast big guy, you can play a different tactic with a, with a with a slow big guy than what you can with a fast big guy. I mean, it's never been my idea, my philosophy, and I've been fortunate enough to always be in a situation where I can choose my teams, where I can go and say, okay, I don't want a slow big guy. I'm not going to sign a slow big guy. But that has, like I said, I have been very fortunate about this. I mean, it, there are many situations as coaches where you come in the middle of the season, um, the management will allow you maybe one or two changes, and that's it. And, and then you got to find a way. you got to find a way. You cannot be stubborn. So um, I, I do think that, that making uh, scripted personnel plans can be an advantage. I, like I said, for me personally, it's, it's, I've never done, I've never, I've tried it. I've tried it, but it wasn't worth the paper. Honestly, it wasn't worth the paper. Um, because I, I had the brand, I looked at it and I said, oh, I'm not feeling that today. And then I put somebody else. I did it in the next game. I did like three, four, five games. And then I said, fuck it. I'm, I'm not doing it anymore because I, 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 wasted this, I wasted this plan. I wasted this energy. But I, I've worked with coaches, assistant coaches, and friends of mine that are doing it. And it's really something that, that I can recommend. Coach. Yeah. Are you looking for balance on the floor? Uh, it means when you have your players, one to 12, don't look about the three other positions, but what is your best? 12 is, let's say, your... The worst? Three, the worst. Sometimes I start with number one, number two, number four, number five, and number six. Number six is the first substitution. That means that someone is better getting in the team so that the balance, after a couple of minutes, um, is stronger. 
Well, I mean, to answer your question, absolutely I'm looking for that. Um, first off, I always want to have an ace up my sleeve. I mean, I'm always telling this when, when even in recruiting, I'm telling this to the player. I'm saying, okay, listen, I know you're an import player and, and you know you want to have good statistics and everything. I'm telling you straight up, my plan is, I'm, I don't know, I need to wait for preseason, but my plan right now is that you're coming off the bench. This doesn't mean you're playing 60 minutes. This means you play 20. Okay, on my team, nobody plays more than 28 minutes. This is the maximum. I think that if you want to play offense and defense, there is no chance at a high energy level that you can play more than 28 minutes. There is no way. At least not twice a week. So with that being said, I'm telling the players, listen, I want somebody, I want your creative guy, your scorer, I want you to come off the bench to have an extra punch. We're behind, you're bringing us back. We're even, you're lifting us above. We're already above, you kill them. That's, that's the plan. But it's not only individual players, it's like whole groups I'm doing like this. I'm, I'm looking at, I always want to have two guys on the court who can handle the ball all the time. I always want two creative guys on the court. They don't necessarily need to be the ball handlers, but I always want two creative minds who can, who can create situations by themselves. Um, and I always want to have of either a pick and roll tandem or a pick and pop tandem on the court. And, and this is how I, I, I start the game, but also how I substitute the game. This is why I said how I, how I feel the game, because when I made this plan about substituting, I, I made, for example, the plan, okay, now I want to have the pick and pop tandem, I want to bring them in after three minutes, and I saw pick and roll is going so, so good, let's just wait with the foreman, let's keep the five men in, let's bring the other guard, because it, it, it's funny, it's, it's, it's not logical, because from a logical standpoint, you would need to sub the big guys first, because the big guys are running much more. A big guy is always running from baseline to baseline, where the guard is running from three-point line to three-point line. This is, a, uh, this is also proven statistically that the big guys are covering much more distance in basketball. And if you're playing the way I want to play, the big guy, they have to hustle really hard. Like, Go under the sprint all the way under the basket, sprint back out to the three-point line, hedge out, sprint back. This is constantly sprinting. Rebound, sprint, fly, fly, fly. If you don't go in five seconds to the other side, you're up. Go, 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 all the time. But I somehow, and I cannot explain it, I found that I need to stop guards first. I need, I need the big guys to be a longer time on the court for them to, to stay in rhythm, for them to, to find the flow of the game, not to... I have really bad experiences with putting a big guy in three minutes and putting him back out. Maybe, I mean, the only explanation that I have, and I cannot prove it, is that they are touching the ball less. And since they are touching the ball less, they need more time on the court to, to get to see the ball, to get to have a positive feedback for themselves. Because we all know in every part of life you're looking for positive feedback, and positive feedback is a... a something that you're feeling good about yourself and in basketball unfortunately most of that comes with somehow touching the ball either blocking it stealing it shooting it passing it um so that's that's uh, i hope to answer your question but definitely i'm i'm always thinking about balance balance on the team and okay maybe except the last two minutes when we're up 40 points then but also, that is another point. That is a very interesting point. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that tactic. I'm not a big fan of putting young guys in the last two minutes when you're up 40 points. Uh, I think this sends a very wrong signal to the young guy. I think this sends a signal of you're not good enough to play with us, but when we're up 40, you will have your chance. Plus, the next thing is that unless the other coach is fair and puts also his youngsters, they will have negative experiences because they're not within the flow with four other experienced guys where all of a sudden ball comes to them or they are doing something and, and everybody is in the wrong spot. When you have five youngsters, the chances that, some, that one is making a mistake is quite higher. So you put them in a disadvantage situation. I'm actually more into putting young guys in the game, for example, as a starter, um, where everybody might be surprised about that, but it gives them a lot of confidence. 
it gives them a lot of confidence. And, and in the past, I, I mean, I don't remember one team in the last six years, se seven, six, seven years that I didn't put uh, under 19 player in the starting five. I always did that uh, for a couple of reasons. I, I think that it's always good to have somebody on the court who really owes you. You know, and if you're pushing a young player, this guy will do everything. If you have experience, if you have really high level experienced players and you tell them, hey, run against that wall. Nowadays, the player will say, hey, run against the wall, are you stupid? Or if you have a, if you have a 17 year old and you say, okay, here's your first pro contract, you're starting five, run against the wall, he will say, how hard? And, and it's always good from a coaching point to have this kind of people in your team for, for chemistry reasons. And, and, and for example, you play a, a bad team and, and coming off, you, you're coming from an away game, long travel, you've been in the bus, 12 hours, shitty food, uh, you play against a bad team, we all know this. I can do whatever I want. I can try to motivate the team in any possible way, they will not be ready to play 100%. No chance, no chance. That, we're all humans and that's just the way it is. If you're a top team and you play against the bottom team and you're coming off an important, important game in the Europe Cup or something, you're not, the players are not gonna be ready 100%. But this 17 year old guy, he will. He will, and, this is, and then probably I will put a second one or a third one. And for me, the quality will come and the other guys are, they are still human and they will still see, hey, look, young fella is giving his effort, diving on the floor. Maybe it looks really bad if I'm putting my hands like this, so let's at least pretend I'm doing it. And, and, and I've, I've noticed that this really helps. It really works. It really works this way. You, you give the young guys the chance, they will give something positive. Maybe not in the scoring column, maybe not from a playing standpoint, but at least for chemistry and motivation. Okay. That's, that's it for me for now. Um, are there any more questions? About game planning, about anything else? you want to know? How much does your uh, game plan changes since you say uh, you don't fully adapt or completely adapt and since yeah, there's a limited information that players can, uh, can uh, retain? How much does it change from week to week? Not so much or? Very little. Very little. Actually, actually it changes very, very little. Um, sometimes we change it just to make it a little bit interesting, not to make it too boring. I mean, that can be one downside that when you have your when you have your philosophy and you're insisting on the same things i mean my 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 second year in hungary we had 78 78 competitive games in one year um so th there are times where you know the guys are away from home no family or this COVID season in poland you know I mean, we were basically isolated we even in even on road trips in hotel we had to eat in the hotel room by ourselves. There was no restaurant open, so you would get breakfast. They would come and give you the tray. So you would be like isolate for like eight months. And then when you, only for practice, you can come together. And when you do the same things all the time for the game, players get like this. So sometimes we would change it or we do something differently or maybe even funny sometimes to, to, to change it up a little bit. But from in, in competitive ways, very, very little, very little. And honestly, when we would, I mean, we would be in, in stress situations where we have a lot of games and we play the second round, we would take the game plan from the first game. If it worked, then we just put a new date on it and that's it. And I mean, we would probably adjust a little bit, but, but basically that's it. Yeah. And, and uh, in playoff situations, okay, we, we, we do change something. I mean, we, we, when, we, when we figure out that there is something that we have a problem with or, or something happens, for example, my my first year in Hungary, uh, in the in the semi-final second game, uh, we we're, were up 1-0 in the second game of the semi-finals. We we're up 20 points in the second quarter. My starting big man took a rebound and another guy fell in his knee and the knee was 90 degrees sideways. I mean, I've never seen this and he was so lucky because there was no structural damage in this knee. I don't, to this day, I don't know how this is possible, but he was out for the rest of the year. He was, I mean, he, he was swollen like this and, and everything. And 
uh, he was out for the rest of the year, and we had to complete from this. We lost this game. We were up by 20 in halftime. I mean, everybody was shocked, and I understand we lost the game. And we had to change everything. We had to change everything from, from the get-go, because we, in this year we had quite big difference in quality on position five from first to second. So we had to change everything, and, and yeah, we adapted everything, and unfortunately it led us to only win the silver medal. But, um, but yeah, this is, this is a situation where we change everything. If something happens like this, or you, you have a lot of situations last year, I have situations where our, our point guard was bought out by Paris Sun in, in, in the middle of the season and we couldn't find an adequate uh, substitution that is in the same style of play. So we had, in the middle of the season, we had to change more or less offensively. We had to change a lot of things. Okay, and it's... What's your opinion about the 8-8-8 eight, eight, eight rule? 8, I use them because um, I first 8 seconds. I, 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 I was assistant coach to Svetoslav Pesic, who claims to be the founder of this rule. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but, but he, he, he always says this. Like I said earlier, I absolutely agree with the first eight second rule. I absolutely agree. I, I, we even cut it to six seconds. We, we said we want, we want to try to score in the first six seconds um, of the possession. Um, especially when we gain possession other than a dead ball. I mean, after a basket or after a dead ball, no. But if we take the rebound or we have the steal, we want to score for sure. I do see what he, what, what he means or what our guys mean with the second eight seconds. Um, I also do think, I'm not a big fan of secondary offense. And, and I also think that it's much, much better to push then to prepare, uh, to move the defense, to engage them, to make them work on defense, and then to use another, in the, to try to score in the last eight seconds. Um, I do know that there is a lot of success with, with guys who are playing a lot of secondary offense. Um, I am more, and I'm not telling my players this rule, but the way we play, is, is that we are using this rule. I mean, we're, we're really attacking first six seconds, then we're preparing, we're running a lot of side-to-side -side things where we're moving the ball and we're moving the defense, and then we have a part, I don't know if it's exactly eight seconds, I want to say it's maybe from, I don't know, 14 to 24 or something like this, where we're trying to score, where we're, where we're, we're trying to set up, we're trying to set up the defense, like I said earlier, we're trying to set up especially big guys that they're coming late for pick and roll defense. We're trying to set them up. We're different, we have different approaches for that, um, but that's definitely something that we're doing in this middle section. And once we've done that, then we're trying to attack. Something else? Okay, then. Thank you very much for your attention, and, and uh, I hope to see you on the big court. Thank you.